Dear brothers and sisters, once again, good morning to all of you who are here with us in person and those of you watching online via our live stream on the internet as well. Let's begin with a word of prayer as we go to our now. Lord, how great is your faithfulness, your name above all names. Therefore, open my lips, open our lips that our mouths may declare your praise. Amen. I don't know how well you can see it up here. We've got a bunch of palm branches, and there's a little pile of rocks, a little pile of stones, right? Stone, so, so dull, so hard, so lifeless. Can such a stone declare the glory of God? Can a, can a stone sing out? Can a, can a stone worship in the presence of its creator? That would be awfully impressive, right? That would take a miracle. Well, you know, one of the ways how the Bible describes a human heart by nature? Like a stone. Dull, hard, spiritually lifeless. Can such a heart... Sing God's praises? Can such a heart declare the glory of God? Can such a heart worship Jesus? Lay it all on the line in the presence of your Creator, your Redeemer? That, that would take a miracle. You know, I've seen it happen. I saw it actually this, this week, Friday morning. It was the early childhood chapel service in this room. They sang a song, Alleluia, Alleluia. Praise ye the Lord. And you know what happened when they got done with that song? Some of you were here. They just wanted to keep on going. They said, again, more. Don't stop. Keep going. And everybody kind of had to you know, hush them down a little bit. They just, they just wanted to praise the Lord. Ah, the love for the Lord so sincere, so genuine, so pure. We saw it again this morning. The children came in. I don't know, well, maybe, you know, it, 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 it's kind of intimidating to come in a bunch, in front of a bunch of uh, grown-ups, you know. But they came in, and, and they sang their song, and they got in. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Their faith so so sincere, so, so pure, so alive. Well, friends, how about you? How's your heart? Is it like that? Like those kids praising the Lord so joyful, so pure, so alive? Or is your heart today perhaps more like this? Like a stone. Dull. Hard. Jaded. Angry. Jealous. Bitter. Frustrated. Can such a heart yet come to life? Can such a heart worship God and, and not be concerned what anybody else thinks or whatever else is going on in the world? Can such a heart yet come to life? Because, you know, here's the thing. Everybody worships. Everybody. Whether you're a Christian or not, everybody worships. That is, everybody has something or someone that they value more than anything else in the world. Everybody has something or someone that they're willing to make sacrifices for. To pursue at all costs with all their energy. Something that you look to, to make you happy or to give you security. Something to rest your heart in. Whether it's a romantic interest that you have or it's your family or your career, or a business pursuit, or your bank account, or what other people think about you, your level of popularity, or it's your personal happiness, or it's your comfort, or it's your leisure time, or, or it's God, who you pursue with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, because you know that God alone can satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. God alone can give you what you truly need. He alone can fill the emptiness that's in your heart. 
I, I pray that, that you are here today because your, your soul, your soul thirsts for God, the, the living God, for his mercy, for his forgiveness, for his grace. You know, there's a, there's a powerful passage in the Bible, Psalm 42, verse 1, which, which talks about this. Our heart of worship, it says, as the deer pants for streams of water. So my soul pants for you. My God, the picture's an animal is being hunted. He's being pursued. Does life ever feel like that? You're being chased or chased away. And you're tired. So what do you see? The deer pants for streams of water. The deer pants to find a place where it can be safe, where it can rest, take a deep drink, and be refreshed. That is what it is to worship God, to seek God, to be thirsty for what only God can give. Friends, is that you? A man once asked his pastor, Pastor, why, why do I need to go to church? If God is everywhere. Why should I go to church? And it was a fair amount of wisdom the pastor said to this young man, well, indeed, the whole atmosphere is full of water. But when you're thirsty and you want to take a drink, you go to a well or a fountain or at least a faucet. Your soul thirsts for the living God. Where will you find what satisfies your soul? Right? Hopefully you're here to, to, to drink from the well of God's grace. You're the only God can give you your heart's deepest desires. But maybe, maybe also there's a, there's a part of your heart that, that's right now seeking after something else. Perhaps, if you're honest, there is something that has captivated your heart. There is something or someone that you see really more than God, that you think will make you happier, more fulfilled, satisfied than God. And are you being honest with yourself about that? I, I was challenged to ask myself that question this week. I had a little devotional, and I asked this question. The question was, what loves or desires do you have that are inordinate? You know, inordinate. Something that's like, it's out of order. It's just, it's become something to you that you want so bad. And you can't figure out why you can't have it. And if you could just get that, right, then you'd be content, finally. The question was, what desires do you have that are inordinate that push God out of the top spot in your heart? So that brings us to Palm Sunday, right? This day when, when Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem. And, and there's a crowd of people there. There's a crowd of, of his followers worshiping Jesus, laying it all in line for Jesus. But there's also a crowd of cynical, skeptical, angry people there, too. They fancied themselves as worshipers of the one true God, but their hearts were far from him. There were those worshiping Jesus, and there were those critical of Jesus, and then there were all the stones lying on the side of the road, which Jesus says might just have to cry out, shout, sing God's praises if his followers stay quiet. Let's hear the words from Luke's account of Palm Sunday, chapter 19, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany, two little towns, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Matthew's Gospel call tells us this was a donkey's colt. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. In case you haven't found out, my theme today is don't get out worshipped by a stone. It's quite a scene here, isn't it? Quite a scene. Uh, the story begins with, with Jesus just outside Jerusalem. And uh, it, we're told the season of time is it's the Passover season. Passover, keep in mind, was at this time in Jesus' day a pretty tense time. It was tense because, as you recall, the Passover was a, a commemoration of God's liberation of the Jewish people from their bondage under Egyptian rule a long time ago. So many scholars believe that in Jesus' day, right, that one ancient great victory of God over, over the, the oppressive regime of the Egyptians long ago would have very much been on the minds of the people in Jesus' day who were living under another oppressive regime, this time the Roman Empire. Pontius Pilate, the, the Roman governor from Caesarea, would have, would have come to town with his soldiers for the Passover with a, with a show of force to keep the peace. Although this wasn't like a, a peaceful kind of peace. This was the, the kind of peace that was only peaceful in the sense there wasn't any obvious conflict or war. The kind of peace that only comes about through great bloodshed. So Pontius Pilate would have come with a lot of pomp and splendor. He'd have come into town and it would have parade riding a war horse. Broad, strong, willing to do whatever Pilate orders it to do. He would have been flanked by legions of soldiers. Carrying their banners and their flags. Polished armor, shining in the sun, their short swords. People on the parade route, if they saw this coming, if they had the guts to stand out there and watch, would have cowered as the Roman army marched into Jerusalem. And then, and then, we see instead this other parade. We see Jesus and his followers. A very different kind of parade. We see Jesus and his, and his followers are there. They literally, they literally take the jackets off their back, their cloaks they're wearing, the clothes off their back, and they, they throw it down on the dusty road in front of this man, Jesus, who comes riding the town on a war horse. Not, in modern terms, riding in some tricked out Range Rover. Not in some armored car, Rolls Royce. Still riding on a donkey, a wild donkey that nobody had ever ridden before. I don't know if that was kind of, oh, you know, when you see this guy. Not what you'd expect. And yet, Jesus' followers, this, this man, they're, they're acclaiming him as their king. They're they are calling him their Messiah. They are celebrating him. <coughs> they're worshiping this man, Jesus. So you have to ask them, why? Are, are they crazy? Because as for this man, Jesus, he doesn't, even, he doesn't even stop to give a campaign speech for the cameras. He offers no sound bites for the Jewish media. Like, like Pastor Davidson talked about a couple of Wednesday evenings ago in his message, too. Like Jesus wasn't there on the scene to try and go viral like some YouTube star. Right? He has no product to sell, no political agenda to push. He has no, no PR team on the scene managing things. Nobody's staging any photo ops. It's just Jesus who remains silent as he rides on humbly and resolutely down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. Why? Because... He knows his mission. He knows that the Son of God sent from heaven to this earth, he wasn't here to set up some earthly kingdom. Free lunch, free food, make life great here and now. He knows he wasn't here to win a popularity contest. He wasn't here to be like a genie in a bottle to grant you your every wish. And he certainly wasn't here 
to give you your heart's desire. If only somebody would finally listen to you and give you what you deserve. No. He was here, willing to suffer the hellish punishment that we all deserve for all the misplaced worship of our hearts. He was willing to endure the penalty of hell in order to achieve peace with God, a peace that would last beyond the here and now, a peace that would extend forever into eternity. That, that's the kind of peace that, that the angels sang about on the night of his birth on Christmas, right? Which the crowds are thinking about. They have to, because they, they cried out on Palm Sunday, the same thing the angels sang about when Jesus was born. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. That was the angels' song. Messiah is born unto you this day. He is Christ the Lord. And so, on this Sunday, Jesus, he rides down on a donkey. Down the Mount of Olives. Spent a couple of short days later on Friday, he could carry his own cross of another Mount the Mount of Calvary. Right? Jesus was willing to endure the greatest pain so that we could gain eternal life. And that's why Jesus' disciples cheer. That's why they can't keep quiet. They, they celebrate. They celebrate Jesus. Because they know him. They've been healed by his love. They have witnessed his miracles. They have heard his wise teachings. Their hearts have come to life through the faith that God has put on the faith that trust in Jesus is so much more than meets the eye. He's also the Son of God, our Savior. And so they praise him. Now, sure, there were there were people there with fickle hearts just like us. There were people there with misplaced priorities just like us. But it's interesting in Luke's account, he says, these are Jesus' disciples he's referring to. These are those who know Jesus most and best. These are those who, who, who love Jesus. Not for what they wish he would give to them, but for why they know he came. And at least in this one moment, they finally get it right. They're going to praise Jesus. They're going to worship Jesus no matter what anybody thinks. No matter what anybody else says. Now, of course, the, there were some other people in the crowd too, right? The Pharisees were there, and all this, all this public worship going on. That got them a little bit worked up. But they, they didn't like all that worship of Jesus stuff. So don't be surprised if there's people today that you think would let, just like you to go home, shut up, be quiet, keep your faith to yourself, right? Pharisees looked at Jesus and they said, Jesus, rebuke your disciples. Tell, tell them that to quiet down, back down, go home. Why do you do that? Because their hearts were hard, dull, lifeless, like a stone. So again, this is what happened. Right at the very end, some of the Pharisees in the cross said to Jesus, Teach the rebuke your disciples. And you heard what Jesus said, right? He said, I, I tell you the truth. I tell you. If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. It must be so important to Jesus that the truth about who he is gets out there. Don't you think? It must be so, so important to Jesus that the testimony of his followers gets shared in public, out there with the world, that somehow, if they're going to keep quiet, if, if, if your witness is muted, or if you are told to shut up, and you can't just for the sake of bursting with joy, praise God, somehow or other, God wants that message to get out so that the very stones of the earth would cry out his praises if we won't. So, what, what about you? Will you keep quiet? Will you let fear cause you to keep your faith on the down low? Will your worship of God be so muted this holy week that your neighbors wouldn't even know you're a Christian?
What do you act or grumble and complain as if being a Christian is such a chore to go to church? Serve God. It's like working in a coal mine. It's not the world would think. The worst thing ever would be to follow after Jesus, the donkey rider. His followers act like he's just no big deal. Will you get out oh, worship by stone? Or, or, friends, is the Spirit of God so stirring in your heart? Doing what the Spirit of God always does through the preaching of God's Word, the very same thing which God spoke through the prophet Ezekiel would happen. I'm going to put a promise of God up on the screen from Ezekiel. Where God says, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of what? Stone. And give them a heart of flesh. In other words, a heart that's alive. A heart that beats with faith. A heart that can worship God. So, friends, now is our Palm Sunday. Right? Not now is our time to worship God. Now is our time to, to sing his praises, to declare his love. Now is our time to, to do a journey to the cross. Now is our time to give our offerings. Now is our time to let the world know that we have a God who loves each and every person on this planet so much. He, his own son came into this world and laid down his life for sinners like us. Now is the time to lay our jackets on the ground and to wave our palm branches in the air. For the king who came to lay down his life and not to make us power and fear. Now is the time to lay it all on the line for him who came and rode into Jerusalem to do the same thing for us. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame until he sat down at the right hand of God. And as I was thinking about stone-faced and hardness of hearts and stuff, there's one really cool passage about a stone in the Bible. A prophecy about what Jesus' his attitude would be like. Here, here it is. And I think we can adopt this attitude too. Isaiah 50 verse 7. Listen to what it says. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. You know what he's saying? I don't care what everybody else thinks. I don't care what everybody else says. I don't care what threats the world makes. I have set my face like flint to carry out the mission of my God. Think of Jesus on Palm Sunday, his face set like flint, riding down to his death. And then he says, I know that I will not be put to shame. And friends, neither will you who put your hope in Jesus. Amen. And may the peace of God, which the angels sang about, and that peace which transcends all human understanding, may that peace guard our hearts and our minds with God's forgiveness, with his grace, until we see him face to face in glory everlasting. Amen.